Kia ora. Uh, my name is uh, Hani Hirame Smala. Um, I hail from the South Waikato, um, a town called Pitaruru. Yeah, I live in Hamilton with my wife and our three uh, teenage boys, and we've got our first uh, moko on the way. So I come from a massive family. Uh, my mum was one of 11 kids, so uh, we spent a lot of time growing up um, at our grandparents' house, our family homestead. And uh, yeah, I suppose, you know, it's a small town, so uh, there wasn't a lot to do there, you know, no McDonald's, anything like that. So, you know, we, we just made fun out of uh, swimming in the rivers, really, and, um, and playing sport was probably a major, major thing to do there, which uh, most, most of the town kids did. Yeah, so I did all my schooling years there and then went off to, uh, uh, did some study at, at Wintech and that, and then I got, uh, landed some mahi within Te Wānanga Aotearoa. Um, sort of doing like administration and stuff and then um, sports kind of picked up for me and then I was sort of traveling here and there and then I sort of shifted in a bit more into uh, education and facilitation and uh, adult education and the likes and so um, picked up to mahi with Hauru Waikato uh, within the mental health space and um, yeah worked in our sort of our, our private training establishment through that um, did that for a number of years and then sort of shifted from mental health into the disability space and been working in disability for probably going on 10 years now. Yeah, I suppose when I first got into that role, I, uh, I came into it as, as sort of an administrator and then um, you know, within our, our teaching team, um, we had um, a komato and a queer uh, from Matakana Island and they educated us a lot on um, Māori mental health and um, I suppose uh, some of the models in terms of like uh, te whare tapawha and te whiki. and so I got to learn all of that and, and took a real interest in it and how um, I suppose I could utilise some of those models within my own life but also specifically within my sports and it's, I suppose it gave me an understanding of how to balance my life a little bit better um, and then now, you know, sort of 10 years on and you see te whare tapawha being used uh, all around, you know, not just in a, in a mental health space or, or a health space but everywhere you're seeing it being utilised and um, yeah, I, just, I suppose I'm quite Great, grateful for those initial learnings uh, way back then uh, to sort of give me a decent concept of it and how I can, I suppose, back then, you know, enter into my adulthood and, and be able to use a lot of those philosophies. And, it, you know, when I was, I suppose, first coming to the international scene, specifically, say, for rugby and rugby league and that, um, it did really help me find some balance because it was tough you know we were we were deemed amateur and so and I had my son and I was a solo parent and so to try to balance that whole uh, life sport uh, balance and, and raise a kid and hold down a job and all of that was real tough and so I always had to keep checking in with myself okay well, why am I not feeling right about something and so I would go through you know that te whare tapa whā through the steps okay what is it you know what is it that's happening within my whare why I'm, why I'm not feeling balanced or, or whatever it is. And so, you know, is it, a, is it my feelings? Is it my emotions? Am I not connected somewhere? Is it my taha side? Is it something going on with my son and, you know, I need a, or, or my parents or something like that? So it was always being able to tune into uh, one of those, I suppose, cornerstones of where things were feeling unbalanced for me and, and what I needed to maybe put some work into or, or if, you know, say, if I got injured, you know, that was always massive for me. So if I got injured, you know, obviously I knew my, my uh, taha tīnana was, you know, not right. So I'd have to rely on the other, the other cornerstones to sort of get me through until I could get through my injury to get back out on the field. So it was just leaning, you know, leaning between that and finding that balance. Yeah, I suppose... Um, Specifically, as a as a teenager, you know, I grew up in, in like I said, a small town, big Fano, and um, I was always quite a tomboy. So, you know, I always was felt like I was always trying to fit in because I grew up playing uh, rugby league and I was always in the boys' teams, you know. And so then I, it's like I struggled to connect to find some some girl mates kind of thing, and so I felt like I was just constantly trying to. Uh, fit in, you know, and uh, fit in with the boys, and then I was labelled a tomboy. So then I felt like I had to. Um, carry on that persona and be that big staunch honey, that, that bully honey, you know, that tomboy honey that um, everyone perceived me as. So, um, but yeah, I knew like, actually I don't really like being that person, yeah, yeah. but I just went with it because that was the perception that everybody had of me. Um, 
yeah, so I think just navigating through that was quite tough. And then I suppose once I sort of, um, well, ultimately I was kicked out of boys teams, right? If you turn 14, 15, you can't play in a boys league team anymore. And so then when I started to sort of, I suppose, pay in, in uh, female teams and, um, and, you know, girls rugby teams and the like, so it was that, that whole transition, like, Actually, now I'm with my own, you know, it's, it's an equal playing field, you know, and I started to make connections and actually quite enjoy that. But then, you know, I'll still say uncomfortable wearing a dress because yeah. I hadn't grown up wearing dresses, you know. So it was always just trying to um, figure out, um, I suppose, that comfortable space. And it's almost like I went from one extreme to the other because now, you know, now I had all these girl mates, which was awesome, but now I felt pressure, now I've got to wear a dress and now I've got to put makeup on and all of that, and I don't want to do that. So it was always like, you know, I just didn't really quite know, um, I suppose, where I was at with a lot of that stuff. Um, and then obviously sexuality came into it and, um, you know, I've got an amazing wife uh, now, but, you know, even just trans transitioning through that and, and trying to figure out, um, that whole space was tough and, uh, you know, having to, uh, I suppose, you know, come out to my parents and, and, and do those kind of things. I mean, that was, that was pretty tough. And, um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know what, I suppose, gave me the courage to. Um, but I remember just saying to my mum, look, this, this is how it is. And um, you can go and tell dad <laughs> sort of thing. And, yeah, and it just went from there. And... Uh, I think what shocked me the most is that how ev everyone was accepting of it, you know, it was just like, it's all good, you know, S specifically the people that mattered, you know, yeah, um, and, and for me that was definitely my family. I suppose the biggest thing that I've struggled with, um, you know, th throughout my life is probably grief. Grief's been, you know, I, I suppose has had um, or created some massive turning points for me in my life. Um, when I was uh, like a few weeks before my 21st, my grandmother, who I'd spent a lot of time, you know, being raised with, she passed away, and that was a, that was a big turning point for me. And then um, I lost my cousin, who was like we were raised as, you know, like uh, like best friends, really. You know, we did all our schooling and all of that together, and that was quite significant. She was 21 at the time; I was 22, and that was a massive turning point for me. And I and I absolutely turned to everything I shouldn't have, you know, alcohol, drugs. Anything, anything to numb the pain that I just lost my best friend, um, and I just thought my world was over. You know, I didn't really know how to navigate that space without my best mate because we did everything together, um, and yeah, that, and that was really tough. And um, and so yeah, like I said, it turned to I suppose you know just abusing uh, alcohol, drugs, you know, isolating myself. I lived in the caravan at my grandfather's house, so that was my little safe haven, and. Um, yeah, and it, and it took me a while to get through that, and it was actually my son that was my saviour because through all of that time I, you know, fell pregnant, unplanned, and um, you know, and then it just ch changed my whole, um, I suppose, outlook on life. I now had somebody else that I had to think about, and um, yeah, my, I think my baby boy uh, at that time saved me and, and pulled me through that time, and then, but you know, I, th I just think grief can take you to some of the darkest places. Um, you know, <clears throat> recently, I suppose I, lo I lost my mum, and you know we went through a tough journey with cancer and things like that. And you know, even as an adult, I was you know 37, 38 at the time, and even that, like, I still didn't uh, navigate that very well. You know, because I think grief is, especially when it's you know whether it's expected or unexpected, it's um, it can just take you to really dark places, and it's that whole. Um, point where you've got to push past actually life does go on and you need to you can need to keep actually living yeah. your life um, and uh, you, I think you go through a phase where you want to do it to to make them proud and things like that and then you just kind of navigate that space and you get through acceptance and then um, but yeah it's it's always been a, a tough one for me uh, grief and that and then I suppose at the moment you know we're we're now back on an, another journey um, with my wife recently diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer, and so we're now navigating that. But we, you know, this time round, we're trying to, you know, she's still she's still alive and kicking and whatever the diagnosis might be, and we we've decided like we're going to approach this with, you know, a real a positive mindset and actually just really live for each day. And it's I suppose a little bit why I've taken on this fight for life thing. You know, it's a sort of 
maybe had a boxing fight in the back of my head, you know, way, way in the back. And there, so when this opportunity presented itself, I was like, well, let's do this, you know. And it's definitely given me, you know, a purpose to, to train, especially since I'm retired, you know, from sport. And so, you know, and, and the frustrations of, you know, um, supporting her through this cancer um, battle and then being able to come here and punch a bag or punch some pads or yeah. punch people, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it actually really helps with, with that as well and getting it out and then I go home and I'm in a good mindset and ready to fight another day. And, um, yeah, I think for me right throughout my life, any challenge that I've been faced with, my physical, I suppose, health has already always pulled me through. So I know if I'm struggling with something mentally, you can guarantee I probably haven't trained for a month. Yeah. You know, if, I, if I'm really down low in some of my lowest dark spaces, I probably haven't trained for a whole month, you know. And so it might take just that initial first step, right, and, you know, let's just go for a walk around the block, you know, and start with walking around the block. Then it might be a one kilometre run every day. Then it might be work my way up, you know, and then next minute oh, I'm training twice a day for a boxing fight, you know. So I've always found that for me, my physical health and getting that right, always, um, I suppose, drives everything else for me, and sp specifically my mental health. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, I suppose just controlling what I can control and not worrying about the rest. Like, you know, I think we get tied up so much in, um, in, in worry and like oh, the what ifs, and I, I just found now, I suppose, you know, as I've definitely, as I've gotten older, like, I, I'm not worried about the what ifs, you know, like I'm just, you, you need to just live in the moment because you, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring sort of thing. And so I, I've tried to, I suppose, best live that life, you know, and, and live within those moments and actually, and just, I suppose, enjoy those moments too and take them in, you know, taking them in is, is such a big thing. Like, you know, we might um, achieve something, but we, we don't celebrate it, you know, or, or something like that. And it's like, let's, let's just actually take those moments. I remember Steve Hansen, uh, the, the All Blacks coach, and he said, oh, in some press conference thing, worry is a wasted emotion. I was like, it's so true. Like, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't serve you well. So why, why waste, your, waste your time on it kind of thing? Um, I, I think for me, like you say, you know, staying well is so important and it's, you know, if you take that example of, say, an eight-week challenge, right, and for me, I try to, like, build really good habits. Habits have always been sort of this thing, I'm, I'm probably a very routine person, so everything for me is about building habits, a little micro, you know, micro skills to, then to the, bigger, to the bigger picture kind of thing, so for me, having a daily routine and building that, so that if I fall off the wagon, after my eight week challenge, I fall off the wagon, then I still know what, what steps I need to take to rebuild those habits to get me back in a good space again. Um, and so that, that's kind of what I've done. And I used to obviously go around to schools years ago and like do you know sports talks and, and the likes. And I used to tell the kids, oh, best piece of advice, fake it till you make it. You know, and I, now I look back on that and I think, oh my God, honey, that's the worst advice you could give kids. You know, and that, that's what I'm telling all these kids all around Aotearoa. And I was like, so embarrassed when I think of it now, you know, and I try, try and change that messaging, you know, a lot. Like, if you want to make something, you've got you to gotta work for it, you know. Like, things don't just magically appear. Don't fake it, you know. There, there's, you can utilise that, that, that um, in some spaces, but, you know, you can't live by that, you know. And I think I... I probably lived a lot of my life by that, and then it was like, oh, this is not working out, actually. Faking it is actually not so good, because then you feel like you're, you know, you're a fraud within yourself, and you end up that whole imposter syndrome, and then you end up like thinking, who even am I these days, kind of thing. So that's kind of, I stopped, I stopped telling kids that message a long time ago. But yeah, for me, it's just, it's just um, you know, really small things, I think, make, make the big difference. I've always been about the one percenters, um, small habits, you know, when I started this, this boxing thing, it was like, oh, okay, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And it, it'll be simple things like, you know, if I set my alarm, as soon as I, I used to say, two feet on the ground, honey, that's all you have to do. You hear it and put your two feet on the ground. And as soon as I knew my feet were on the ground, oh, sweet, I can stand up and, and I'm away sort of thing. Or even my preparation prior to that, I'll always have my training gear ready right next to the bed. So I just pick it up or I put it in the bathroom. So I go in the bathroom, get changed while I, I don't know, sort of on the toilet, whatever, and, you know, 
and try to talk myself out of whether I'm going to go or not. <laughs> I was like, oh, they're cancelling it. No. Oh, well, I'm changed and I'm gone, you know. So it's all those little, I think, micro habits that, that, you know, build now. It's like, if I don't, you know, um, do training now, now, now that feels weird. So, yeah. But the, probably the biggest thing that I, I noticed with Cairo is there's just no judgment, you know, from the, the day that I walked into the gym to the, you know, even the, the message that he sent to me saying, hey, I'm going to coach you for this thing. Um, come on it, you know, come on in when you're ready kind of thing. From the day I, you know, met him, there's just been no judgment, you know, he's not worried about the past, you know, he's not worried about anything and he's just been like, right, let's just, let's go, let's see what you got and, and um, you can see that his passion and his love for, for the sport, for boxing, comes through in his coaching, you know, and it's not just his coaching with me, it's his coaching with the kids, with, with everybody else that's part of the gym, with everything that he does, and he just lives and breathes it, but he delivers it in a way that brings you in, you know, it's not about, oh, you know, you're new to boxing, and so you have to learn this, this, and that. He's like, hey, yeah, let's work on this, and oh, that was really good, um, and, you know, go work on this, and then we'll try this, here. and it's all about trying things with him too, so he just embraces, um, that, that whole, um, I suppose, delivery in terms of his coaching, uh, I suppose, with just real, real care. Like you can see, he genuinely cares about the people that he's coaching and about the sport, you know? So I suppose that's what's really made it easy to, to come to training and, you know, and, and not feel judged and not, you know, I don't even, uh, you know, it's not like, oh, I've come in here as a, as a ex, you know, pro athlete and now I'm supposed to be this big amazing boxer person not even you know there's, there's been absolutely none of that kind of talk you know and and I, I really love just having like all the kids around as well it's a real fun environment and you don't often well obviously in you know high performance sport what I've come out of you know yeah it's it's can be very you know um pro professional and serious and all of that and you come in here and it's like it's just like being back home you know and it's like oh everyone's everyone's cool everyone's fist pumping you know and you know, some of these people I like chatting to and I've just met four weeks ago and I'm like going home and telling my family about them, trying to get my sons to come here. I'm like, you fellas should join my gym. They're like, whatever. Yeah, so yeah, I really get that real genuine, um, genuine feel about, you know, everyone, everyone, all ages, all shapes, all sizes, all everybody is welcomed and, and you know, he'll coach whoever, he wa uh, whoever walks into those doors. Every single fighter that's that's going to go up and, and be a part of this fight for life uh, event is showing that these these rangatahi, these young people, you know, that when opportunities present themselves, as scary as it may be, because it's super scary, you know, don't get me wrong, just take the leap, just go for it, you know, it's all about just saying yes and then working towards that goal, you know, and it, the, the outcome really actually doesn't matter. It's been a bit about the process and the journey that I've loved the most, um, and. I just, you know, it, making connections, making all these new connections um, now that I've stepped into this realm. But um, I think every single fighter that's put their um, put their hand up to say, yeah, look, I'll do it, you know, have actually genuinely done it because they genuinely really want to support this co-papa um, because there's just so there's there's so m many things that are happening specifically in and around Aotearoa that our, that our rangatahi and our tamariki are having to deal with and if they don't see um, role models like us or, or even adults take, you know, uh, taking these steps and take, you know, having the courage to step into these kind of spaces that we're completely unfamiliar with, then, you know, what have they got to look up to, you know? So, you know, I, that, that's, I suppose, where what what I feel for, like how I can impact some change here, like, look, I've never done this before, but I'll just give it a crack anyway, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's, for me, it's about that that whole process and that journey more than anything, and um, I always think, you know, when I, when I, I uh, think about my youngest son, you know, and I say, oh, hey, son, this, da -da -da -da, you should give this a try. And he's like, no, you know, straight away, no, no, no. And so I think when I get presented with an opportunity, I want him to say, yeah, okay, I'll give it a go. And he'll be like, you can't do that, mum. And I'll be like, yeah, I know, but I'm going to try real hard, son, you know. And so for one day, I want him to be like, hey, son, do you want to try this? You know, do you, you want to go for a drive, learn to, learn to drive, son? And one day he might just be like, yeah, okay, I'll give it a go, you know. So it's, it's just little things like that that... that Give them the courage and the confidence and hopefully the inspiration to just be like, yeah, okay, sweet, I'll give it a crack, you know. The biggest thing for me is just patience. Like, oh, you know, like I, I, I'm not a patient person and 
when you've got a teenage boy that talks to you in, in one word every single time and years and nas and, hey son, how's your day? Good. You know, like, it's, it's, you've got to sort of navigate that space. But for me, I think the biggest thing is just um, staying open, staying open and, and waiting for those moments. And then when, when uh, you know, when they approach you with that moment or they want to talk about something, being ready for it. And, you know, it, it comes, um, you know, v just on the on the most randomest times when you know, because like simple things like we could be just driving in the car and you know, be like, oh, how's your day today? And there's just zero conversation. You know, they're not in that headspace, and I have to accept that and just be like, okay, look, not the right time. That's fine, you know. And it might be something that I want to like, really nail down and figure out what's going on. Um, but then you'll get those moments where they'll be like, oh, hey, mom, you know, da 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 da, and it's like, oh, here we are, here we are. Calm down, be patient, you know. So for me, it's it's that and and waiting for those moments for when they're ready to open up. And, and have a conversation. It might be something big and might be something small, um, but but just that they have um, that they know that they can come and and have those conversations with me. Because if they're not um, going to be talking to to us as their mums, then who are they talking to? And, and my guess is probably nobody. So what's going on in their head, you know? And it's just trying to filter out that. And you know they've had to overcome you know a fair few challenges in their lives and and even navigating you know this what we're going through at the moment is a whānau, you know, and, and just trying to grab those little moments where we're going, oh, how are, you, how are you going? You know, you, are you good with what's happening? And, you know, and then sometimes they're like, yeah, and other times they're like, oh, and they'll start asking questions. And so the moment they start asking questions, like, okay, cool, yeah, that, this is on their mind. They need to know a bit more, give them some clarity, you know, and stay open. That, that's probably the biggest thing that I've found with teenage boys. <laughs> I would want to be remembered as someone that was a competitor, you know, in life and everything that I do, but also um, very caring. Yeah, so there was two kind of key words out of that, like, you know, I'm driven to, to compete and, and, you know, do, and I suppose do things really well um, and, and, you know, real, with, with real drive and, um, but also, you know, just ensuring that, you know, care and respect is absolute paramount in terms of values. Thank you. Just made that one up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are the words? <laughs>